wonder if he's ready. Are we live streaming? Cool, right. Cool. Right, welcome everybody to the um, Geological Society for this evening's um, engineering group meeting um, on the A1. Um, I'd like to, to start by thanking Gia Brook for sponsoring the, the refreshments, which I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, we have a few housekeeping notes. First of all, there, there isn't due to be a fire drill tonight, so if the um, fire alarm goes off, uh, there are exits there um, and at the back, and we meet in the courtyard um, for the Royal Academy. Can I ask that you um, turn off or switch to silent your mobile phones, please, so as not to interrupt the, the speakers? Um, and also, there's a register going around. Um, I, could I ask if, if people could sign that? Um, You'll see up on the, on the screen we have future meetings coming up. Uh, our next meeting is the 14th of June on glacial deposits. Uh, that's a one-day meeting with a, a variety of speakers lined up. Our next evening meeting is the 12th of July um, on the accelerated programme for uh, Moore's Crossrail Shaft Construction. Um, also is um, our annual field trip this year to Lyme Regis uh, between the 17th and 19th of June. I know it's a bit early yet, but I'd uh, like to, to mention the um, uh, reintroduced annual X conference um, and save the date for that, which is the 12th or the 14th of uh, April 2018. Um, and the theme uh, for this first meeting is uh, keeping lessons learned alive. Right. Um, without any ado, I'd like to introduce the, uh, the two people from... Um, WSP, sorry, thank you. I think, Athena, you're starting. Excellent, right. Um, everybody, um, Athena, Livesey. Thank you, Ursula. So welcome to the A1 Coal House um, to Metro's Improvement Scheme. My name's Athena Livesey. I'm a Principal Engineering Geologist based in Manchester, and today I'm co-presenting with my colleague, Tristan Morgan, who's a Principal Geotechnical Engineer in the Newcastle office. Today we're going to tell you a story about how we contributed to saving the client £2 million by using the live geological model and how the design was governed by the rock mass assessment. There's nothing like good timing. Last week um, we found out that we won the Robert Stevenson Award in the large project category at the Regional Institute of Engineers in the North East. The award recognises engineering excellence on North East infrastructure projects and Needless to say, congratulations to everybody involved. So, I have 11 years global experience working on highways, tunnels, um, across the globe in Australia, the Arabian Peninsula and in the UK. Uh, on the A1 widening scheme, WSP were responsible for the mine void consolidation works and also the rock cut stabilisation works. Every good geologist will know when you're asked we just need you to go up there for two weeks. It never is. I ended up staying up there for 14 months, and you'll soon find out why. And overall, I spent two, two years on the scheme. I'd just like to take this opportunity to introduce to you the Association for Consultancy and Engineering. We have a progress network, which is for the emerging professionals, and our slogan is, a professional network for tomorrow's leaders. It's a UK... Um, network and it's split into regions and the committees organise events about hot topics with senior leadership, workshops where you can learn business and leadership skills and also practice them at the same time and also we have nationwide initiatives and this year um, we've got the focus on reverse mentoring for the digital transformation. Reverse mentoring is where the emerging professional is the mentor and the, ses the sessions could discuss <coughs> discuss um, social media, simple things such as using your phone, because now we've got Samsung 8, but also looking at how we can use virtual, augmented and mixed reality to improve the efficiencies um, during construction and connecting the design office to the construction site. Now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Tristan Morgan. Good picture. Hi, my name is Tristan Morgan. I'm a, as Athena said, I'm a principal geotechnical engineer working out of the Newcastle office for WSP. Uh, I've had around about 15 years' experience. 13 of them have been with, well, Parsons Brinkhoff now WSP. 
working as a geotechnical engineer for large and medium scale infrastructure projects within the UK and outside of the UK. The, I was involved on the A1, not quite as long as Athena was, uh, but uh, involved nonetheless with the mine voids uh, treatment and the rock cut stabilisation. So I think in total I was on, on site for about six months and then helping out with the reporting for, uh, for a few more months after that. So let's see if this works. Yay. Okay then. So just give you a quick agenda for what we're going to talk about quickly. Uh, I'm just going to give you a bit of a project overview so you can find out where Gateshead is in relation to the northeast of England and where the scheme actually sits. I'll then give you a bit of a brief of the conceptual geological model and what we thought we were going to anticipate to find. Then Athena is going to talk about the construction phase and what we actually started to find on site. And then I think she'll hand back over to me to discuss the slope stabilisation works and actually how we, we fed things into each other. And then Athena will give us a nice summary at the end. So, where does the project sit? So, the project is located in the northeast of England. It's, uh, well, it's actually got a pointer there somewhere. Okay, so it's in the northeast of England. You've got Newcastle uh, to the north of the river. We've got Gateshead to the south. The actual scheme is located in Gateshead. So just be a bit careful when you're working out where you are. Um, you've got the Junction 67, which is the Coal House roundabout, and Junction 71, which is the met uh, Metro Centre roundabout. And the scheme is approximately six and a half kilometres in length. Um, and the area here is known as the Team Valley industrial estate. The project was actually part of the uh, How is England's uh, strategic network and the idea was to bring uh, economic re rejuvenation and reduce congestion on the roads. So it's actually what the scheme looks like. So this is the 2014 before the scheme started. The original highway was built in about 1974, so you can imagine that uh, during that time, congestion and actually road traffic has become more of an issue. We've actually got two lanes originally with a slip road off, which goes on into Gateshead and on into Newcastle. The 2014 scheme um, was to propose to add an extra lane to the main carriageway and then uh, separate link roads on either side, so you, you end up with three lanes in the middle, and then you end up with another two lanes. So you end up going from three lanes to five, basically. Um, admittedly, our highways engineers had some great fun putting in, getting all this stuff to work together and getting it all to work within the footprint that's required, because this is still very tight. You've got different uh, vehicle restraint systems, separated roadways, more vehicle restraint systems. They've all got uh, things to tie in. So the bits that we're going to talk about really today is the mine stabilisation um, and the rock cut, which is the bits of the work that we were actually dealing with ourselves. <clears throat> Just to give a bit of a background on the scheme, give you a bit of a context for where we sit within the geological uh, environment, if you like. So we're actually within the middle coal measures, the Pan middle coal measures, which are pretty much across most of the northeast. These lovely green and yellow areas here are the sandstone, or the thicker bands of sandstone. These grey areas are your mudstones, thinner beds of sandstones and coal itself. So a few things to note. This white line is our scheme. It's a little bit hard to see. We've got the yellow topographic uh, lines over it as well. So we've got these primary faults in the area, which roughly run all in roughly in the same direction. And then we've got these secondary faults forming these herringbone structures. And we've got one that runs parallel with our rock cut slope here. So the site levels roughly start off at around about 45 metres. And uh, we're actually on a, a bit of a hill, really, that has been cut through with the original road. 
So we start off at around about 45 metres and we drop down to about 30. And then at road level, we drop very sharply from that, about that 30 metre line down to about 19 metres, which is what the road level sits at. So you can see it's a, it's a reasonable size cutting. So this is actually an extract from the 1 to 50,000 data rather than the 1 to 10,000. The 1 to 10,000, you can see the mining seams and everything else that's underneath there. So from the, the idea of the quaternary geology there, uh, we've got, we're in a big thickness of, again, that's our scheme here, this black line. We sit within the, the glacial till materials, which is uh, quite thick in the area, which is between 10 and 30 metres, depending on where you are. Uh, we've got undulating rockhead features uh, from the, as a result of the glaciation. Uh, and you've got infilled backfill channels, again, rel uh, as a, related to the glacial till and the glacial uh, periods. We've got this area of lovely area of made ground, which is related to uh, the minor history of the area and uh, open cast mines and quarries that were done there, as well as underground mine workings, which cover the whole area. We've also got this band of glacial lacustrian deposits, which is uh, in the northeast, but it's like a laminated clay we, we get, uh, one of a better description. <clears throat> so as I, I kind of touched on there, we do have a mining history uh, in the northeast. So there's approximately 20 seams uh, in the area. Um, nine of which are within 170 metres um, uh, of the surface. Uh, four of them are around the seam, which are these ones, which are the Maudlin seam, the Durham Low Main, the Hutton and the Harvey seam. We also have these, where we have these thicker sandstone bands, we also have these associated ironstone nodules, which makes it a bit of a fun for excavation purposes and for, for getting things done. So as I said, there's a, it's a pretty decent history of uh, mining going back even to Roman times. Uh, if you pull up records from the Victorian era, you've got uh, notes in there saying things along the lines of historic mine workings present at this depth in this seam. So you can see that there's a reasonable amount of information. So we did have pillar and store workings underneath the site. This is a, a photo, not of our site, but it's, it gives you an idea of what a pillar and store workings would look like. <clears throat> We've got these pillars of coal left in. We've got these stalls where they would actually work down the, the sides of the pillars and work through. And we've got these roadways which would have been constructed within to sort of take out the coal and to get it out from site. Um, and to get it, get it up and sell it off, I suppose. Um, you can also see in here we've got these this lovely roof features where you end up with uh, fractures and joint conditions being exposed in the, in, the, uh, in the roof. And you have these rock falls and these where the pillars get eroded and weather with time. You end up with pillar spa uh, spalling and weathering and general collapse of the pillars uh, or progressive... Uh, deterioration really of the pillars. You can also get conditions such as floor heave where you have the pillars start to compress and force deformation in the floor as you go through. So this is just one method. They'd also uh, do things like rob pillars on the way out. So we, we, we had mine abandonment plans for the area as part of the death study. Uh, they're notoriously difficult to locate yourself in relation to your site uh, because you end up with, they're concerned with features that are below ground, whereas we're concerned with features above ground. We were lucky in our site, we managed to be able to have a few shafts that we had locations for that we were able to tie them into. But, <clears throat> um, but yeah, so we would be looking at extract rates of between 30 and 70%. And you'd have a number of these seams work below the site, so it wouldn't just be the one seam. So we actually started to pull together a bit of a story for the site uh, to work out what we're dealing with, really, and where we need to get more information and where we've got information gaps. So you can see 
these green, lovely green lines here, which are faults taken from the 1 to 10,000 map, which are actually at depth within the seam. So they're uh, faults that are recorded uh, by the miners as they were taking them out, really, or the, the geologists that were, were looking at them. We've got these red uh, lines, which are the uh, observed faults at surface. We've got this green line, uh, so this yellow line, which is actually our site where we want to um, construct. And we've got this lovely area of made, uh, large area of uh, open cast mines that is associated with the area. And these are the shafts that I was talking about. So we knew where they were from the coal mine and authority records. They were able to give us that information and that gave us a way of tying together some of the mine workings. Interestingly, uh, there's no record of mine workings under this area, but obviously if they've worked up to that zone there and it's recorded, we know that they must have, it's a fair assumption, to assume that they've worked up to that area and um, underneath it. So as Athena said before, we, uh, the original design was for a board piled wall uh, in this area. <clears throat> just bear that in mind, that's what we were originally looking at for that cutting. That was what the reference design stated. <clears throat> so how do these mine workings and how will they interact with our cutting and how would they interact with our surface? So if you look at this, there's plenty of Syria guides and uh, information from the coal authority and advice notes and everything else that go along with it, but the abandonment, uh, abandoned mine work in Syria guide is pretty good at this. So it gives these three different types of void migration or collapse that you can expect to see in, uh, in the seams. There, there are a few more different shapes that you can get there, but these are the, the main ones. So you've got the re rectangular one, the wedge failures, and the conical failure. We know by the guidance notes for the area that we've got around about a bulking factor of about 30, and we can expect conical collapses in the area. So that gives us this ratio here. So we know that we've got to go up to that this line here, and we go across to... So that's 10 times the seam thickness that we can expect of rock head cover require, uh, required above the seam to uh, stop any void migrations to surface. Now, what that assumes, it assumes a couple of things. That you've only got one seam worked. You haven't got any progressive failures of seams below. So you, you, you haven't got the scenario where you've got a seam that's worked below that may only have five meters, uh, five times cover working into another seam that may only have five meters cover and you get a progressive void migration through. Now, as I said before, we had four seams that were below the site so that was a, uh, a likely problem. <clears throat> so next phase really was when we got to site uh, in 2014. We looked at this information. We had all this background data. <clears throat> and we found that we needed to find more information on the ground conditions. We needed to work out what was behind this rock cut that we were going to expose before we started digging into it. So first put a call was really to get a, some boreholes along this crest <clears throat> of the slope. And you can see that there's very tight access uh, along the entire scheme. You can probably just about get a Land Rover in between that varia guard and the uh, actual uh, hard shoulder there. We also had a, a this strange feature which we couldn't explain, which was this um, retaining wall feature, even though it wasn't put down as a retaining wall, it was a facing wall, is what it was called on the drawings. Um, we didn't know why it was there, because you can kind of see that they could have created a slope in there that would have worked, they had enough room to do it, but they decided in, to not for one reason or another. We didn't know what that reason was because they never recorded it in the uh, as built data. So alarm bells started to go as soon as we saw that wall and found out there was no information as to why it wasn't. It's a very well-constructed wall for the time, if you would imagine. <clears throat> so we got the feedback from the ground investigation data. And as expected, we have a number of faults in the area, for starters. 
This red line here, sorry, is the rock cut line. So it's the floor of the rock cut uh, at road level, if you like, or just below. These, you can see these red lines, these faults that are in the area. Uh, we've also got this, I don't, I don't, it's quite hard to see, this red line here, which is a fault that runs parallel with the face uh, of our rock cut. We've got this, as we expected, this undulating rock head surface in this area. And this is where that strange wall feature was, we couldn't explain. And in that area, oh, sorry, I point out that there's, you can see these areas here which are the broken ground. We've got coal seams where we've actually encountered them intact uh, at depth. We've got, again, a lovely area there which is very voided, but it's got a, a very thick sandstone roof rock above it. And we've got this area here which is again a shallow we've hit a coal seam but we've got indications of a void migration in there so we started to form more of a picture um, with keeping this live geological model and informing ourselves at each time as we went along so in in this area you'll notice that there's a lot of bed rotation or indication of bed rotation now we think that's because a lot of these features so we've got two faults in this area we've got a third which runs parallel with the face We've also got void migrations below. So a combination of those factors have probably led to that block in there of moving and becoming distorted. We've also got a potential glacial channel in there, which Athena will touch on later on. <clears throat> Just switch back there a second. Something else to quickly note is that we've got these the groundwater isn't constant across the site. It, it varies. And we believe that's to do with the faulting and how the mine workings and the faulting have worked together to kind of distort or change the uh, groundwater levels. <clears throat> that fed into a 3D model in CAD which uh, we, so we, we, we added the borehole information, we added the 1 to 10,000 uh, geological information, and it started to form these pictures, which are great to present to clients so you can kind of explain and to contractors what you're looking at and why you need to, where your areas of crossover are that may be higher risk. So you can see the site is this, these purple lines in here. These are the slip roads moving off. This is the, the yellow lines of the faults, and you can see how they're, orientated. We've got these planes that are in here, which are the various seams and how they underlie and interact with the area. <clears throat> so with that, I'll hand back over to Athena and I'll we'll talk about the construction phase and how we address these problems. Thanks, Tristan. So I hope you've all formed your conceptual geological models. And that is exactly what we use to direct our grading strategy, to treat the mine workings and mitigate the potential of long-term effects of subsidence and void migration. At the design stage, the initial grid, um, we created a rectilinear grating grid with a primary grid space in a four and a half metre centre centre spacing. Um, and that was also governed by the rock mass permeability. Uh, we had a target depth of 30 metres below the underside of pavement. We pumped in about two and a half swimming pools of grout, basically, under gravity, um, across our site. And we drilled 900 boreholes in total. We, where we had high levels of grout tape, we reduced that grout spacing by drilling secondary holes. And to test that we had stabilised the ground and essentially the effectiveness of the permeation, we did an in-situ test where we would pump grout into the hole um, under a nominal pressure, about 50% of that overburden pressure, and hold that for two minutes. Now, if that was dropping, then we would come back and fill that hole. If it, was, if it stayed at that pressure, we considered that that area there was stabilised. We used a great mix of uh, one part ordinary Portland cement to 10 parts PFA, PFA um, with about 60 to 70% water. It should be noted that um, the grout is not there to strengthen the ground. It's there to only um, infill the voids and the broken ground 
and to uh, reduce the risk from mine void migration and collapse. We don't want any crane holes forming within our, within our rock cut floor and therefore the pavement. The rock cut area was already assessed as being a high risk area because we knew that the ground underneath <laughs> had been mined. We could potentially expect voids within the face and collapse structures. To help anticipate these poorer ground conditions, each grout hole was logged. We had the drillers logs which would record the solid rock, the um, broken ground and any voids. Um, we also had the engineering geologists on site where we could listen, observe and record. And any changes within that conditions and we'd sieve the water the flush returns um, helping us understand if we were coming across sandstones mudstones and this was really useful to identify potential changes to the <coughs> conceptual model and therefore communicate the hazard and level of risk effectively to our client you can see there in the photograph we're drilling on um, a temporary bench which is actually above that retaining wall and we're also drilling on an incline so we can grow into the rock cut face By reconciling the two sets of logs, we could produce the long section to anticipate geological hazards below the ground level and also into the cut face. And this is really where that live geological model is starting. And this helps us understand those ground conditions immediately. And we can therefore develop the great program and identify those poorer ground conditions and anticipate where there's potential health and safety issues. Here is an extract of our grating model, and it's also been overlain by uh, surveyed geological features, which are here in black. So as the cutting was um, being excavated, we could see at that, uh, if I go back, you can see there that the upper slope is in between glacial till and rock. And I'd walk along there with our surveyors scrape off all the soil on top and identify where we had faults within that. And they'd survey that and we'd bring that back into the model. What you can see, as seen in our desk study, is that we've got these fault-bound uh, blocks and mining would occur in between the faults and terminate on the faults. It's a hypothesis, but actually it does align with the faults that we found in the face. And also we found hot spots uh, just underneath the cut face, like here, which is also telling us that we have potentially poor ground conditions into the face. You don't want to um, drill into the face and then find that you've got nothing to anchor into. There's no resistance. So that was a very good indication um, for us to identify where we've got safety critical areas. When we started to open the cut, it was clear the relationship of geological hazards was more complex than anticipated. So by being on site, we could complete geological mapping and rock mass assessments, updating the geological model. A number of structures were identified that you would not necessarily pick up, even with closely spaced GI. Faults within the, middle, the Pennine middle coal measures have actually very distinct features such as a carbonaceous phyllosilicate infill. And we've got one here. But also these beds, I, we did go to the BGS and we uh, invited them onto site. And we also went to universities, which are specialists in structural geology. And they too were kind of uh, surprised by these features. And, but this here, I think, is a fault with rotation as well into a mine void behind it. So it's actually dipping into the face rather than out. But you can see that over a very short space, there's so much change in the rock mass quality, in the lithology, um, in the fracture spacing, uh, and there was a lot of evidence of movement. So you could suggest that this was a thrust fault because of the, the slick inside that was on there and also the infill, and that was also agreed with the BGS. We were there on our, on our knees mapping that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So this live, live ground model approach enabled the rock crook treatment design to fit the situation found on site, which is how we prove the value of having engineering geologists on site. As anticipated by a conceptual ground model, we encountered uh, glacial channels. And we had one that was particularly deep for rock, not, well, the glacial channels in this area can be 30 metres deep. And ours was six metres deep at the deepest. But the soil engineering was designed by another consultant. Therefore, I was very much interested in the soil rock interface and the deformation of the rock head. And what I had was um, numerous, oh, sorry. What I had was numerous fractures which were open, they were weathered, and they were infilled with the glacial till. So hugely reduced in my rock mass quality at the surface. To stabilise a rock cut, it's important to understand the global failures mechanisms and that of the individual blocks by understanding the relationship between the rock discontinuities. We completed geological face mapping, which records the physical characteristics of the rock and how the intact rock is dissected by discontinuities. It's important that we understand the morphology of those discontinuities and to understand the strength of the rock mass and assess the slope stability. Now, so we did, this is a, um, a simplified um, um, description for, for, for today. Um, but at the top, you can see that we've got a sandstone bed. This is a panoramic image, so there's a bit of distortion. But due to the excavation, they just look like fairly regular blocks. But we know, as engineering geologists, that if you want to map a face, you need to be at the face. You need to, un you need to take the dip and dip direction. You need to understand the morphology of those discontinuities and if there's any change. And so we hired a mobile elevated working platform. And I'd just like to stress there's a load of health and safety um, issues associated with that and everybody must be harness trained, you must have a working platform, and various other things. Um, but up I went, and when I got up to the top, it was very clear that this was not straightforward at all. We found, as a result of the excavation, a sawtooth pattern was created due to the face orientation being oblique to the fracture pattern. You can see as well that we've got a range of different size blocks. Even the orientation of the lower, um, the lower bed is different to that of the upper bed. You have to clean off all this material on the surface so you can see what's going on, understanding those fractures. There's no point mapping stuff that's covered in soil and debris. In the upper picture, you can see that we've got stress release joints, and that's what we expected when we did our conceptual model because we're on the side of a hillside. And also, due to the subsidence fractures, the, the regional dip of one to two degrees to the east was, was distorted as well. It was, it was tilted and rotated. So even the block in front was a different dip to that behind. And we're steepening up now as we're going in, into there. And this is a one and a half meter block. So, which is also sat on a weak mudstone which is deteriorating due to weathering. And we've also got groundwater moving through the face. So to capture this information, we drew to scale our block diagrams on site. And this really does exp express how complicated those blocks are. You've got your faults, which um, you don't see in that previous picture, but you have faulting, you've got bed and shear slip, you've got excavation fractures, you've got tectonic joints, you've got stress relief joints, and then also you've got your subsidence fractures. And all of these are at different orientations, and they're changes, changing as you're going along the chainage of the cut. So this level of detail was required to determine the bolt location and orientation, and this also shows that our solutions need to be dynamic since the mechanisms for slope instability continuously changed. 
As each section was mapped, we also carried out a rock mass assessment using Binyowski 1989 and the Geological Strength Index. This is a way of assigning a quantitative value to the quality of the rock mass. It provides guidance for how much face support would be required, such as the rock bolt size, length, spacing, and if you're going to need any mesh. Of course, you've got flexible mesh and you've also got reinforced mesh. It's very important that you understand those two different things. Um, the geological strength in, uh, index is interested in the lithology, the structure, the surface conditions of the discontinuities, and it's also used to estimate the rock mass properties. So it's used in rock lab, for instance. But we, we know that it doesn't apply to structurally controlled failures, hence the mapping. You have to do both. <coughs> and also, those shear surfaces... Um, the strength of them are prone to deterioration, as we saw in the previous image, where we've got those very um, thinly bedded mudstones at the base of these bigger blocks, and they will deteriorate. And we do address uh, water pressures with effective stress analysis. So when we're moving to areas of higher risk, we want to try and manage that. And one way was to do top-down construction. Where we had that retaining wall, we advised that they would do drops in one and a half metres and that we would map it. So we cleaned off all the grating soils that was left over, all the, I want for a better word of rubbish. <laughs> so, and you can see here in the top picture that we've got sandstone blocks. And on the bottom, as we're moving along, at the same elevation, we move into the weak mudstones, clearly areas of a change in lithology and the faulting. Also, these, the fractious uh, patterns within the sandstones uh, are distorted, the orientation changes, the spacing changes, and you have different shaped blocks. We had some rhomboid blocks rather than your uh, cubic blocks, like those at the bottom. And we've also got these steps which help identify that we're potentially above a mine void and subsequently a migration feature. I think these are also helpful when you're looking at the orientation of your bolts. It's very easy to put in a, a bolt in this location and pick up numerous blocks where I could change the orientation either into the face or across this way to provide further stability. Taking the information from the death study, the ground investigation, and mapping, we produce cross sections at regular intervals. You can see here that we've also got the great inner holes from the drillers' logs. We reconcile this information to help us identify if the faults are going to act as a release plane for that global failure, because they go through the full height of the cut. And also identify if the rock mass quality behind the face will be poorer, and hence determine the length of the bolts. We also, even though this is the final face, we were mapping the materials in front of it to help understand that wider 3D geological model, anticipate changes as we're going into the face. You can see that by doing that, we could easily identify a fault that was between the point in front, which was about eight metres in front, to that behind. Using the great logs, and where they encountered coal, we, all, we could understand that there was a change where we had, where we had, um, where we had those coal seams. And then we did um, investigation into the face. And um, so we did inclined holes from the face level, but also extra bore holes behind. And this is the kind of complex geological model <laughs> that I didn't anticipate to see when I went up just for two weeks. As the excavation progressed, we found a series of mine void substance features. In the top left, you can see that we've got the conical void migration next to a worked seam. You've also got the collapse, a collapsed void next to two weathered faults intersecting here. This is our parallel fault, and this, and this is one of those herringbone secondary faults. We've also got a grated mine void with beds rotated into the void. Now, we saw something very similar in our boreholes so when you're drilling and you see something that you're not anticipating, you have to question why. And this is a perfect example 
50 degree dipping bedrock into a void and that's what we had within our cord boreholes as well. But obviously we also had faults. And then here we came across airfield voids, um, which is where the overburden has fallen into an open void below and similar changes in stress above the voids creating this bed separation and sagging. Within the quick face, there was evidence of grating mine voids. And you can see that we've... Oh, sorry, exciting bit. So, <laughs> um, that you've got the coal seam here, you've got the conical failure, you've got the grated seams, but what is important when you're planning your stabilisation works is understanding what are these features going to do to your rock. Above the um, voids, we had... Um, high angled weathered fractures basically are very much closely spaced you can see there's not much going on above the intact coal seam but over here we've got plenty of fractures same within this falling into the central point of the hole where we've got the conical void migration feature when we hit the cut floor we found that we had coal pillars and either side there was great in the floor, which is suggestive that that is the grate that we, you can find in the top of the roof of the void. Um, this cold pillar might actually be a rib because it went into the face, so it's greater than 5.3 metres. These coal seams, can, they, they can be singular, but they can also split into smaller coal seams and we know that historically that some of these seams were worked by children and that seam there although collapsed um, would have only have been maybe like half a metre less than half a metre thick and, and men too and women families were down the mines working together um, and but just imagining working along there on your belly this has all been worked uh, and you can see here that you've got those vertical fractures again above the work seam and then we've got these faults as well. We've got, there's a fault here, which is um, oblique to the face. So I'm going to hand over to, the, to Tristan. <laughs> Thank you. So as Athena explained there, we had a lot going on in the face. And the origin, original reference design was to have this all-encompassing board piled uh, support uh, stabilisation structure along, along the face. So what we looked at was we found that there were some areas that were good, there were some areas that were poor. Uh, so we had these more dynamic solutions that we were looking at, these rock-nailed solutions that would hopefully cap well, would capture the, the problems. So initially, again, uh, once you'd exposed the cut face and you got down to level, the first bit to do is to uh, prep the face, really, and to clean it off. It also gave us a second uh, chance, or, or a final chance, to make sure that we picked up everything in the face and mapped it all, and that there wasn't any overhanging blocks or areas where there was loose material or potential for causing problems later on. So, um, yes, a lot of us standing around the front of the face telling the guy he's missed a bit there and that he should scrape a bit more off and it wasn't clean enough. And then there was lots of um, lovely name-calling. I think they followed on from that, really, um, from these guys, it's particularly when it's in the middle of December and it's snowing and it's pouring down and everybody, everybody enjoys doing this sort of stuff then. Um, so, really... What we did was facial prepar uh, face preparation, scaling, making sure you've got all the loose material off so that, you, again, you can see it, you can see your faults, you can see where your blocks are and where you may need to put in more critical dowels or where you need to put in more um, uh, higher levels of treatment. So we had a number of uh, options, really, that we, we looked at for treating the face. You can kind of see this... Upper section here, you can see where we've put in uh, critical dowels, where we've identified the, the faults and where they need to be treated and where we need to do 
higher levels of treatment and it looks a little patchworky when you actually drive along the scheme. You've got areas of uh, shopcrete, you've got areas of teco mesh uh, in, the, in the areas where you could get away with um, uh, better rock quality. We've got areas where we've got a mixture of both, so we've got an area where we've got uh, shotcrete and teco mesh. We've got areas where we've got um, reinforced shotcrete um, and uh, uh, large sections of that. So just to go over the, the kind of the extreme ends of the scheme, if you like, is uh, this the system we use with so the Geobrug uh, teco uh, mesh system, which is the third system, which is a it's a great system for putting up. Actually, it's um, it's relatively light when you, when you compare it to uh, similar systems. It's an active system, so it means that it binds everything together and pulls it all up and it tightens it all together, so it's holding your rock in place uh, as you go once you've got it all up. The crucial bits to the system are to get it to conform to the face, which you can imagine on a nice, lovely, flat face is brilliant, but uh, getting it to conform to uh, dog-legged, shark-toothed, rock cut that we had was, uh, again, lots of fun for the guys who were actually installing it, but uh, they managed to achieve that, and we had um, some representatives from Geobro that came out at the end and had a look at it for us and confirmed that they were happy with everything that was there. The other, the other critical bit of the, is to get these spike plates on correctly onto the mesh system to make sure you've got the spacing and everything that you need. So the spike plate, what it does is it's got to be at the correct orientation so it holds the mesh. Unlike a, a passive system waits for something to move to, to catch it and, and uh, stop anything from falling, this actually tightens and tensions the mesh. So it's, it's critical to get those on uh, correctly. So this is what they actually look like when you're on, on site. So this is them installing the, the rock bolts. So we would have, as Athena said, we'd have areas where we had maybe sandstone blocks where we would use critical rock dowels, which would be there to just support <coughs> that bolt or to uh, treat that area. We would have pattern dowels, which were there to create the spacing or the... Um, uh, the correct shape that we needed uh, out of the dowels um, to make sure that the load was equally distributed over the mesh. Uh, and we also had crest anchors, which were again in the in there to part to form part of the system for a ret uh, retention system. And we had these um, contouring dowels, which were only a, they only needed to be a meter long, but they were the sort of where you had a dog leg and you wanted to pull the uh, mesh into the face. That's what they were there for. They didn't have to really support much of a load. But the, the idea of this mesh is that it doesn't work as a single bolt. It works as a full system. So you're, you're looking at getting the system integrity rather than one particular dowel in. That's really what the critical dowels were for. So the next level up for that, to where we had areas of poor rock mass, or rock quality rather, uh, in the, say, the mudstone bands where we had extensive areas or behind where we had that wall, we looked at a, a, sh a sprayed concrete solution or shotcrete solution, whichever you want to, whichever your preference is to call it. So what we had in there is we had a, first off was to install the rock bolts and put them in and they were put in at um, very tight centres. Uh, we worked out a centre based on that. Um, engineering judgment. Then we put in strip drains to make sure that we didn't get any build-up of water pressures behind the wall. Then your reinforcement went on, uh, so it was a rigid uh, rectangular reinforced mesh. Then your layers of shotcrete were built up uh, over set distances. Where we had interactions with maybe faults or where we had areas where we may have the, in the glacial channel, for example, we would install some weep holes uh, to allow any extra. It's really as a bit of a, a secondary measure in case there was any uh, build-up of water pressures behind there. We also had these horizontal drains, which were six metres long, moving back. Great funky system. They, uh, they, we designed these 
couplings with the manufacturer to allow you to uh, maintain them, basically. So these things are normally very difficult to maintain from a live road scenario where you're trying to keep everything open. And we don't really have much in the way of the hard shoulder in that area because of the uh, constraints on the footprint. So they're, they're able to just drop that coupling off and just jet, uh, jet wash it out, basically, when they need to maintain it, which is, which is great. So this is actually what it looks like during construction. So we've got this top picture. Is you can see the strip drains, the rock bolts in. They haven't got their plates on yet, and they're propping the welded mesh up against the face. You can see it's, uh, it's all lumpy, bumpy, as you'd expect from a very uneven rock face surface. The second larger picture here is the first layer of shock creek going on. You can see here, so the first layer of shotcrete has gone on, it's been brought out, and the uh, plates are just going on uh, to the rock bolts. This, in the background of this here, you can see the final layer of shotcrete going on. In these, and these are the, what they look like when they're finalised. This um, bottom photo is, it's almost like a mismatch of the two conditions. So what we've got there is a We've got a fault, or it could be an area, a band of mudstone that isn't particularly extensive or, or an area. And what we would do is, there was no point adopting this solution because it, it wasn't extensive enough to warrant it. So we tightened up the spacing of the rock bolts in this area. We shotcreted over, um, added some, where at faults really, we added uh, a strip drains behind and weep holes all the way around make sure that there's no uh, build-up of groundwater behind. And we adopted the same Teco mesh solution. And it was just really to hold it in and to stop weathering from exposing that fault or degrading the face. <clears throat> and with that, I will hand back to Athena just to give a summary. Thank you. Okay. So... The one critical message I want to get out to the engineering society is that the oh, engineering geologists as well it, it, is that we must maintain these live geological models. There's many projects that I've come across where I have people not even mention their ground model when they're talking about their solutions and whether they're even fit for purpose. And on this project, by maintaining our live geological mod model, we managed to manage the uncertainty on site. We created an opportunity to use a range of lower cost and effective slope stabilisation solutions. We were working, it was a design and construct contract. So we're under high pressure and funds are tight. And um, mining impacts are an out of site and out of mind problem. And they have a major impact on projects. By being present on site, the remedial options were designed, specified and implemented in a timely manner, allowing the contractor to direct their resources where they were most needed and also reduce the impacts on the construction programme. With these changes, the specification was rewritten on site and we were working collaboratively to make sure that we would improve safety during the construction works. And this... Um, and also like educating our contractors and the clients on site, telling them about why are the ground conditions changing? Why is there a risk? Why can they not do it in this order? And being on top of them as well to, to assist them so that no, no accidents were going to happen. And overall, by having our engineering geologists on site, we contributed to a cost saving of two million pound. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Athena and Tristan, for an absolutely fascinating presentation. Um, we're now on the floor to, to questions. Um, can I ask that you, for the benefit of the people live streaming at home, that uh, you save, uh, save your uh, name and um, affiliation. I'll be roving Mike um, to, to make sure that uh, you're heard back home. Has anybody uh, got any questions? Yeah, right.
Uh, John Perry, Independent. Um, you mentioned at the beginning about a facing wall in the original slopes. Um, I didn't quite catch how an important a clue that was and the purpose of the original wall. So um, when we were developing our conceptual model, we were obviously aware that we had mine void substance problems and therefore potential for migration. The wall itself didn't have any as-built drawings and it was just, it seemed like it was just there as a facing and obviously it was because there were mine void features behind it. So the, they, the highways team had used that in the historically to support the face or, pre or prevent further deterioration because as you saw earlier, not all of these mine void structures um, are big voids. They could just be highly fractured rock or they could be a small airfield void. And that was that, that's what they'd done. And for us, it was another alert that some, uh, someone else had said, let's do something about this, but the rest of the site is all right. Does that answer? Sorry, ju just to add something to that as well, there's, there's a, a history of uh, structures in the northeast which... They're not really there as a structure to support something. They're there to, say, protect an exposed coal seam that uh, you may, say, local people may come along and rob mm -hmm. and remove and then undermine the, the slope. So sometimes you don't know why they're there, but, uh, but they're, they're, they're there for a reason sometimes, but it's, it's not always an engineering one. Okay. Um, thank you. Any more questions? Um, I've got one to keep the ball rolling. Um, towards the beginning, you um, presented uh, on a figure um, contours for the depth of the coal, coal workings, that, that was or the, the coal seams. That was the surface. That was the surface topography. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. That <laughs> removes the need for my question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Bill Murphy, University of Leeds. Um, could I ask you just to skip back to your long profile sec geological long profile section? Uh, yep, there's a, I have other slides if uh, needed. This one or? No, keep going by. It was relatively near the front oh, of, of the, the top. Keep going. Oh, the, yep. you look um, no, keep going. <laughs> That's the one. Yeah. Um, what was, I mean, the, it, there's a very noticeable change in the dip towards the middle of that, that profile, with everything else being horizontal, maybe sub-horizontal, depending on the apparent dips. What was that? I mean, that's, that it's looks as if it's almost 45 degrees. Yeah, it was. What was the cause of that? So we had, um, we had about a 70 metre section that was dipping out the face at 50 degrees. And that was due to the parallel fault at the front. So the warping that had happened. Okay. Because it was such a large section, it wasn't contributed to a series of mine void collapse. <coughs> right, so that change in dip is a result of a fault? Yeah. Why does it not go deeper down? Because um, there was, well, this is the conceptual model. So we knew that we also had some thrust faulting, but on site, it's, Full height. So this is this is before we went to site. Right. Yeah. So there was so because um, also as we were going down through the core, um, we went back to horizontal bedding. Okay, but I mean that that's that's kind of what it's throwing me a little bit, and maybe I'm missing something. It's it's just that upper section that that you're describing as being faulted, and that's... that's yeah, so we thought maybe there was a, like a thrust fault that had come up and was tilting that, and that's why we were then going to our experts, like in the BGS and the universities, to help us further understand those structural features, because we know that as like chartered geologists, when you come to your limitations, you have to reach out to those experts. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Kieran Quigley, uh, Mark McDonald. Um, you just mentioned the spacing of the dowels was determined by engineering judgment. 
Um, I just wondered what judgment that was. The, for, the pat for the pattern bowls, we actually used to, um, actually through rubellum. And we also, where you had finer grain materials, we would adjust that spacing so that we could sh shotcrete the surface without any interruption. So you'd have like, because uh, in your cyclotherms, you've got your sandstones and then you've got mudstones, co um, coals and finer grain sandstones. And we wanted to protect that area so it didn't undermine those, um, those thicker sandstone beds. So we'd spray that, but then just adjust our spacing. So we were then putting our pattern bolts within the sandstones, the thicker sandstones. So it didn't create another path for water to enter the vase or come out through that way. Okay. And did you find that there was a greater density of uh, discontinuities in the weaker materials like the mudstones compared to the sandstones? The fracture spacing in reduced in spacing in your thinner materials. So they're more closely spaced. Yeah. Thank you. Clive Muir, independent. What, what was the cost relative to the board pile solution? Um, that was about like a million. It was about, yeah, we, yeah, about a million pound. Because you've got the steels, you've then, so you've got the steel, you've got the logistics, you've then got, it was, it was going to be full height. So our, the height of our cutting was 14 metres. So full height and then embedment depth into the floor below. And yeah, I think, um, like, I think it was something like £4,000 per metre, and then you've got to extend it upward and then along. So that was the estimated cost. So the, the total savings is a million? Yeah, I think it's about a million. So that's like, when you think about the value that having an engineering geologist has on site, you know, to be there and to make those assessments, it's worthwhile. So just, just to add something to that as well, the, the other thing which is a little bit harder to try and quantify is actually the program savings that you make with going with a, uh, a slightly softer engineered solution versus a harder engineered solution and how the logistics would have worked um, in that such a tight envelope to work out mm -hmm. so and how they they would have been uh, able to get the material out and meet the deadlines that they required to do to get that material excavated out and replaced and everything else it's uh, that's a harder part to to quantify but it's 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 again uh, not a small figure Um, I'm sure you'd like to, um, to join me in thanking um, Dina and Tristan again for their, their fascinating presentation. Um, the engineering group would like to, to now invite you all to, to uh, retire into the lower library where we have um, a Wine and Nibbles networking event. Apologies to you, uh, live streaming at home. Excellent. Thanks, guys.